good morning. Um, it's uh, Sunday morning, and here I am in my backyard. There's my bird feeder right there, although the battery wore out. It's one of those kinds that you fill up, and then it has the battery underneath, and then when the squirrel comes, it jumps on the little bar, and then it spins them, and they fly off, but they're not hurt, but they're surprised, and then, you know, you watch them, and you have endless um, uh, fun watching the squirrels tumble, um, which was fun. And it was a, a good investment, but the battery, you know, it, it, it's rechargeable. But after a while, of course, you need to be able to get to the battery to do anything and can't get to the battery. So, um, or at least I haven't been able to get to the battery. So there it sits. And uh, we have enough squirrels here that it would not be a bird feeder, it'd just be a squirrel feeder. So that would be that. Uh, welcome, thank you guys for coming. Um, sorry that it uh, took me longer, but uh, um, there were technical issues I tried last night and it just didn't happen. So I, uh, here I am again uh, to try this second one to see if my camera will work. And, uh, you know, technology is a blessing until it doesn't work every time and then it's like, ah, technology. But, um, since the only other option is for me to uh, go house to house and say, hey, you want the Sunday school lesson? We'll sit, stand over there and then we'll put a little plexiglass barrier and then, you know, me go on for 20 minutes. That would be awkward. Whereas this isn't awkward at all. Partly because you can, uh, you know, tune in whenever you want, so that's pretty good. But uh, thank you guys for your continued support. Today, is um, in Matthew chapter 16 but I want to tell you um, first that I was watching the other night a documentary about video games and I was never a big video game player uh, you know back in the days of the arcades you try to find an arcade today but back in the days of the arcades um, Barb and I would go uh, when Beth was first born and we lived in Atlanta, there was a little um, arcade right over somewhere um, near us and we would go and we'd go in the middle of the afternoon and there was this old guy that was watching over it and because it was during school, public school, and I was in uh, going to Emory at the time, so I you know, had odd classes and then sometimes during the day Barb and I could go out and he would watch Beth I know it sounds like we're unfit parents but there was <laughs> the old video game guy would watch Beth and we would play uh, video games uh, we got two quarters each because we had a dollar to spare that's what kind of big spenders we were <laughs> we had a dollar to spare on the video games we'd go play the video games and uh, and then, you know, we'd thank him and leave. And um, since there was no one around, and he seemed to enjoy playing with Beth, uh, and we could keep an eye on him, too, in, in case he tried to bolt with her or something like that. But as it was, he just fed her bananas, and she, you know, cooed and crawled around, and, uh, and then we moved on. There didn't seem to be any permanent harm with our daughter, so that was good. So... It struck me as I was watching this video game that, you know, we were doing that in the mid-80s, right when video game arcades were reaching their, you know, peak. But it said that what happened was the first video game came out and it was, uh, you know, very popular. And then a second one came out that was a slight variation on that. And then a third one came out that was a little different, but, you know, different colors or had different stuff. But... Um, you know, eventually, um, it got to be big money because everybody was like, ooh, video games, I've never seen that before because it was new and, and something. And so everybody was playing them. And there was so much money going on that all these corporations got in on it and started replicating these games. And, of course, they wanted to do what was safe. So they would make a game and name it something to, you know, totally different, but it was really the same game. 
and then somebody else would come up with a, a, a you know a new name and they'd paint the cabin a different color and make it pink instead of green and now it's a new game it was the same game and the corporations of course were wanting to um, make money but they wanted to play it safe so they thought what we'll do is we'll just keep doing the same thing everybody else has done <laughs> and then everyone will love it because they love it now they'll keep loving it they'll love the same thing and it wasn't until somebody um, came up with a new brand new game that was and of course he didn't work for a giant corporation uh, they just came up with a, a, you know a totally different concept of a game and it you know it looked risky to the big corporations but to the little startup it was like well what else do we got and then of course it turned into um, Nintendo <laughs> so all the big corporations were over here trying to replicate the same thing pouring millions of dollars into the operation and then the, the somebody on the side looking at it um, realized that they didn't want to keep playing the same game they wanted something new and and so they did that and then after that what happened was the giant corporations would uh, do what were called focus groups and those focus groups were uh, groups of people that they would get and they would say, well, how do you like this? And they do that for all sorts of things, cars and cookies and video games. And they would sit there and say, yeah, okay, how, how do you like this? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And then they'd let people discuss it and they'd let them play with it and then they'd figure out what, how to tweak it and make it better. And they use focus groups all the time to do this, to find out what real people like and don't like as a way of improving their product and making it so that they could sell more of the product, that, which is you know really what they want out of the whole deal. And it, that made me think about today's scripture, the, the, the fact that doing what everybody else is doing, but also of having the focus group and of, of you know finding out what's what to make it not a risky proposition find out what's you know how can we do the best thing and here it is uh, Matthew 16 uh, starting with verse 13 16 13 and I'm reading from the Jerusalem Bible here um, as a matter of fact, this was uh, Mom's Bible. Maybe I mentioned that, but um, uh, so she asked if I wanted, and I said absolutely. And now I have this copy as well. And here it is, chapter uh, sixteen, thirteen in Matthew. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he put this question to his disciples: Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now he's referring to himself in the third person, but there it is. And they said, some say he's John the Baptist, who we know to be dead, but you know, a reincarnation of John the Baptist. Some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, he said, who do you say that I am? Now you recognize this as sort of that same idea of a focus group, is that, uh, you know, been out doing stuff here for a while, and what do people think of me what's the buzz what's happening there uh, as far as what people's opinions of me what's the deal and um, apparently the disciples and of course some of the disciples came to Jesus specifically for these reasons they uh, you know they went to see him and and there were other people talking about him and they were um, struck by what he said and then they would go and say, oh, well, you know, Jesus has obviously got something going on. And they responded to that. And they came after him. But they still go around when they're, you know, talking to towns and they're sitting out there and Jesus is preaching. And they say, oh, he's just like John the Baptist. Oh, he's just like Elijah. Is he the second Elijah? And so they're, they're listening to Jesus and figuring out from the focus groups what's going on with uh, with Jesus what's happening and um, 
what everybody thinks of. And now he's saying, okay, that's what everybody thinks. That's, that's the, the general opinion of me. Now, and here's the next part. Uh, but you, he said, who do you say that I am? What do you think of all this? We've been doing this for a while, going around healing people, preaching. <clears throat> uh, it's chapter 16, so he's been at it a while. They've seen him walk on the water, multiply loaves and fishes, heal people, uh, you know, be argued at by the Pharisees. He's seen all of this. They have seen all of this, the disciples. And now, in this moment of reflection, Jesus says, well, what do you, what do you think? What's the scoop? Who am I? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter spoke up, you are the Christ, he said, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are a happy man, or blessed are you, because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you but my father in heaven so now i say to you you are peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of the underworld the gates of hell can never hold against it i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven whenever whatever you bind on earth shall be considered bound in heaven whatever you loose on earth shall be considered loosed in heaven then he gave the disciples strict orders not to tell anyone that he was the christ Peter spoke up and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus and Jonah and Jesus said, Well, you know, God, God led you to this conclusion. It wouldn't have been obvious to you on your own. And it it struck me as I was reading that and thinking about the, the video game <clears throat> documentary, that in any large enterprise it, it's always um, you always want to become risk averse that's just the way it is it's um, whatever you've been doing and have been doing okay about it you want to keep doing that and that's just human nature to want to do what what has worked in the past and that, that you're going to continue to do that um, some of you uh, were aware that my great-grandfather William Anderson was a bishop and uh, at one point in in 1922 he was asked to go on a, a camping trip with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison and Harvey Firestone and Warren Harding and the some of the most famous men of the day and 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 my great-grandfather and so and there he went and you know apparently had a great time but that was still in the heyday of the Model T when um, Henry Ford had made his vast fortune from making a car that everybody wanted cheap reliable um, transportation that was easily fixed and he started in 1908 and by 1922 he was still cranking them out and it was around that time. Oh, there's the, the neighbor's dog. It's quite the barky one. Uh, by 1922, he was still cranking him out. And it would be several years later that he finally realized that Chevrolet, who was making an updated car, um, more modern car, was beginning to sell as many as he was. Now, the Model T had, you know, sort of gained a life of its own and he was reluctant he was reticent to cut it loose but finally um, he recognized that it was time to to move on from what had always worked even though it had always worked that he had to he had to make a choice and just like the video game people had to make a choice well you know but this um, this style of game has always worked. Well, it's not now. What are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? And now along comes Jesus, totally different than anybody had ever seen. There, 
There wasn't a category like Jesus. Which is why they were all over the map when people were trying to decide what category to put him in. <laughs> Who is Jesus? Well, I don't know. Is he like Elijah? Well, yeah, sort of, but not exactly. Well, Jeremiah? No. How about John the Baptist? Hey, no, not really. The son of the living God fitted exactly. <laughs> and Peter recognized, um, again, I think Jesus was right with God's help, that um, there was something amazing about Jesus and their relationship and his relationship with God. And it seems to me that the, the church over the years um, has gotten in trouble whenever we wander away from that Jesus, the Son of the living God, and our relationship with Jesus in that. Because over the years, and if you don't have to read much church history to figure out that um, the church has gone up and down, if you looked at the graph, uh, especially in uh, you know Western Christianity, there were times when everybody's going to church and times when nobody's going to church, and there have been various responses to that from the you know church leadership, but it almost always is let's keep doing what we've always done. Um, let, let's, you know, it worked the last time, let's do it this time. And instead of looking forward to their own relationship with Jesus and how that informs their own lives and their response to whatever modern culture was, whether it was the 11th century or the 15th century or the 21st century, um, it, the there's always a, a, um, a movement toward wanting to do what we've always done. So let's just do it better. We haven't been doing it well enough, so we want to do it better. We we'll want to do what we've always done. We'll just do that. And so you'd look at the programs and you'd look at the hierarchy and you'd look at the buildings and you'd look at the, uh, you know, whatever you're looking at. And I think Jesus was saying, you know, the he was telling us the answer. Right there was, the answer is, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Our relationship with Jesus is going to be uh, the thing that um, gets us connected with God and able to live as kingdom people. Because you can't just reduce being uh, members of the kingdom of God to a set of rules and say, well, if you follow this, you'll always be doing the work of the kingdom. That's, that's it. Because the work of the kingdom, being a kingdom person, is about being in relationship with Jesus. Being in that relationship and letting that relationship inform you to see how Jesus reacted, what Jesus told us, but how Jesus, uh, you know, actually lived his life. And then I think that would have been um, sort of, a, you know, fixing the problem of, say, in the, you know, Middle Ages. And they say, oh, the, the Muslims are coming. What do we do? Let's get an army and go kill them all. Well, that's the thing to do. Let's do that. And of course, they had the first crusade and the second crusade and the children's crusade and the little crusade and the, the there were all sorts of crusades. All of them about let's get an army and go, uh, you know, kill these people. And you never heard Jesus talk about that. <laughs> you never heard Jesus say, you know, what we need to do is just get a bigger army and go wipe them out. That's the ticket. Because when people lived. The life of the kingdom it wasn't as straightforward as getting an army and going killing a bunch of people that's certainly true uh, you go make the streets of Jerusalem run, run red with blood and you can see your your accomplishment right there it just has nothing to do with Jesus it has everything to do with the power that you want and Jesus was telling us uh, here it is the relationship we have with Christ, how we live it, 
is going to determine not only our own uh, happiness now, our own blessedness, but determine our own ability to pass on that blessing, to be the blessing God would have us be, which is, um, you, you know, in one way easier to just, well, I'm in relationship with Jesus and here's Here's the natural outcome of that. Uh, it's easier, of course, to, you know, reduce it to a set of rules or to try and, you know, work it out that way. And I, I'm guilty of that myself, to look at and see what's run uh, in the past and not to say, what would God have me do now, today? And of course, here it is. Now we're at the Christ, the Son of the Living God. That's <laughs> go back to living a re in a relationship with Jesus. Then look at the world through those glasses. Don't look at the world through the glasses of the focus group or what worked in the past. Look at the world through the glasses of being God's disciple, being Jesus' disciple and figuring out what that means in my relationship with the world from that. The other way around. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then you don't need the focus group. You have the relationship, which we have freely for us, um, which is a cool thing. And uh, I appreciate that Jesus has reached out to me in mercy and love uh, with that and of course to all of us well once again thank you I've uh, um, exceeded my time by a minute or so but uh, uh, you know I appreciate you listening as always thank you very much love you guys and look forward to being with you um, in person here in a little while someday <laughs> but not today uh, but someday, and I appreciate each one of you, and uh, keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.